Every business that he has started has become a billion dollar business, taking them all public. I think now even they split up XPO into three businesses. So it's seven businesses that are all publicly traded and all have been quite successful. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. Thank you for tuning in to this emergency podcast. That's right. This is an emergency. This is why this is a little bit extra that you're going to get this week on the Construction Leadership Podcast, as I have joining me once again, my friend and business leader, Mr. John Vaughn. Now, this name sounds familiar. John joined us on episode 380, not that long ago, and episode 323 to talk about what we normally talk about in our chats going back and forth, which is leadership and management principles that come from the realm of sports. But no, not today. No, this is an emergency podcast. Now, this is the bio of Mr. Brad Jacobs from the back jackets of his new book titled How to Make a Few Billion Dollars that I would recommend to a friend. What's the subtitle? (laughs) There is no subtitle. When the title of your book is How to Make a Few Billion Dollars, you do not need a subtitle. So here's his bio. American entrepreneur Brad Jacobs has a unique track record as a Wall Street moneymaker. To date, he has founded seven companies, all billion-dollar or multi-billion-dollar corporations, completed approximately 500 M&A transactions, that's mergers and acquisitions, 500, that's a lot, and raised $30 billion of debt and equity capital, including three IPOs. Jacobs began his career in 1979 at the age of 23, with his first startup, Amorex Oil Associates, followed by Hamilton Resources, both privately held. He subsequently created five publicly traded companies, United Waste Systems, United Rentals, XPO, and XPO's two spinoffs, GXO Logistics and RXO, which we discuss, I know, it's a, it's a lot of letters. Jacobs grew XPO into a top 10 global logistics provider and the seventh best performing stock of the last decade in the Fortune 500. XPO stock became a 32 bagger. Initial investors in 2011 made more than 30 times their money. United Rentals was the sixth best performing Fortune 500 stock during the same period and is now more than a 100 bagger. All right, actually, this is really long. This goes on for a minute. You get the idea. This man knows how to make money. He has a plan. In fact, he put it down on paper and he's making it available to you with this book, How to Make a Few Billion Dollars. Why do I care? I care because this man is coming to our industry. That's right. He announced, and we're going to play a few clips and why I'm talking about this with Mr. John Vaughn in this emergency podcast, because you need to know. I firmly believe that this man is going to disrupt our industry. Good? I don't know. Bad? Who knows? We're going to find out. But he's coming. He's got a playbook. I've read the book. I've listened to, I hate to even admit this on the air, probably like nine hours. (laughs) Nine hours of this guy talking every podcast that he put out since 2011, I've listened to. And I believe some of these highlights are important for you to know before Mr. Brad Jacobs arrives in our industry. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mr. John Vaughn talking about Mr. Brad Jacobs. As always, thank you for listening. Mr. John Vaughn, welcome back to the show. Always good to be with you, Bradley. So about a month ago, I said, there's this guy, Brad Jacobs. He was on this podcast that got referred to me by a friend. If I could be so bold as to call him such a thing, Mr. Pat Clancy from William B. Morse lumber company in upstate New York. And I said, this is an emergency podcast. We need to do this immediately. You got to buy this book. I listened to, no, this isn't even a joke. I'm, I'm overprepared here. Like eight 
different podcast that he was on over the last five years. I'm like, we need to talk about this immediately. It's an emergency podcast. And here we are five weeks later getting together to talk about Brad Jacobs. However, I still think it, it is critical. We know who this guy is and what he's attempting to do in our humble little industry. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. You, you, you sent me the first clip and I'd heard about him, but I was like, I really need to get deeper into this as well. And I did the same thing, bought the book, listened to the podcast, looked on YouTube for a couple interviews from him. A uh, very interesting background. So started off as, I believe, an energy trader and then moved to the UK, did a brokerage company in the oil and gas space, came back to the States, did a, a waste management business, sold it to waste management mm -hmm. at some point, did United Rentals, and then got into the uh, logistics business, bought, uh, started a company, XPO, and I was broken out into three businesses. So every business that he has started has become a billion dollar business, taking them all public. I think now even they you split up XPO into three businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's seven businesses that are all publicly traded and all have been quite successful. Yeah. And that's what caught my attention the most is somebody who has a track record of coming in as an outsider. Uh, he was, he was like 22 or 23 when he got into, and this, I believe is the early eighties into oil brokerage and then got into, I don't even know, whatever the hell the business is where you actually quote unquote, take ownership of the oil commodity in barrels and then trade it that way. Then came back, started buying landfills and buying trucks. So it was hauling waste, sold that to waste management, then got into the equipment rental business. So United Waste and then United Rental. And he's a United guy. United guy. Yeah. That business was generating a billion dollars. And they said within four years was like the market leader. So ultimately created five new businesses, all billion dollar businesses, spun off two of them. So there's seven. And even if you just kind of look at, by the way, I kind of had heard of XPO, but once you start looking around, looking you for XPO, it everywhere, it is everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So you'll see those. So XPO is uh, LTL shipping, uh, less than truckload. The GXO is all like warehouse management, which is obviously relevant. And then this RXO is kind of that automated brokerage of matching buyers and sellers, largely using digitization, which I have learned is a very hard word to say, John. <laughs> So now he wants to roll out QXO, which is really targeting what space, John? The lumber and building material space we so fondly called LBM. Uh, so yeah, coming into the LBM space, uh, talked about buying from wholesalers, selling to retailers. And so that's the the place he wants to play and so wants to be a billion dollars year one, five billion dollars year three, and is excited to come into a space that he feels like he can transform in some to some degree. Yeah. So obviously with his track record, he has some friends in the Middle East. He has some friends around the world. He rolls in with a pocketbook full of a couple billion dollars in cash and he wants to do a roll up. And he kind of noted there's 7,000 distribution companies in lumber building materials. There's also 13,000 in Europe, but he did talk about some different parts of the segmentation. So part of it, I think is exactly what we deal with. He also talked about doing some uh, supply to commercial construction, which I know we do some, but he also talked about heavy highway infrastructure. And right. the thing that jumped out to me was, all right, how well do you know these customers and what relationships do you have that might speed this development? Obviously with the uh, equipment rental business, he's going to know a lot of contractors. They were doing a lot of heavy highway stuff. So I think that aspect, he's probably already got some momentum or some relationships there. But there's just a bunch of question marks. And my thought was, John, how often does someone say, I'm an outsider, I have a track record of success. He rolled into freight in 2011 as a complete outsider and started executing this playbook, which is the playbook. It is a book. Then he goes on and says, here's everyone what I'm doing. And I wrote a book about it. I'm like, well, it seems like- And a, then now I'm going to go use this book that I just wrote in a new industry. Yeah. It seems like a double dog dare for you to pay right. attention to me. And I'm a sucker, maybe. I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so yeah. bought the book, read it, listened to all these podcasts. And I wanted to talk to you about it. We're going to play a few clips from a couple different podcasts that he's been on. One in November of 23, one in December of 2023. Uh, just to kind of give us a little context that we can use, I think, to structure- this discussion. Yeah, because exactly what you said, there have been people that have come up and said they were going to do it, that were outsiders. 
And by the way, there was also somebody who was an insider with Home Depot that had incredibly deep pockets that said, watch this, hold my beer, watch this, we're going to roll it up and make it great. And they are no longer in the space either. So it'll be interesting. It's a, a little bit of the not so fast, my friendly Corso. But, you know, I mean, based on his track record, it, it, it's hard to bet against uh, his ability to execute on what he said he wants to do. Yes. So I had some family and friends that were in the freight industry that are in the freight industry. So what I, of course, I distracted them from running their lives. I said, hey, do you know this guy? They obviously knew him very well. And I said, do you have any experience with him? One person that I talked to is like, I, I've had lunch with him a couple of times. And the overall reaction of one person said I couldn't use their name, nor could I not record the phone call, actually works with XPO, actually in the Atlanta area. Uh, no, Florida, but close to you. And they all had different stories. What had come out was this guy is a very nice guy, by the way. I pinged him on LinkedIn and I just kind of told him kind of what we're talking about here. And he said, I would love to talk to you, love to come on the podcast, follow up with me later in the year after we start doing some things. And he commented how he loved my first name because, you know, get it. Same, same. Same, same. So but they said he's, he's a nice guy, but he's like, thinks differently, thinks big, is going to roll in fast. And all of them said some variation of the exact same phrase was, do not underestimate this guy because he does look very average, right? He's, he does not, <laughs> he doesn't, and his results are anything but average, right? But you yep. look at him, you're like, this guy? And I'm like, and they're all kind of like, inside, there's a killer inside of him. I'm like, all right, then fun. We're going to pay attention here. So we're going to start off here with this clip that came from Odd Lots that uh, Pat Clancy sent me. And it's from one of the hosts, Tracy, asking just a very broad question about uh, the potential resistance for technology in our space. So let's play that now. And this is all this crucial stuff that's sort of at the center of how the economy works. And it's like they're in WhatsApp groups. And yeah. does anyone have, can anyone pick up a load in Akron <laughs> and bring it to El Paso next week? And this is how it all works. It seems so informal. And then, of course, it leads to these inefficiencies like trucks running around empty, basically. What's it called? Deadheading, basically. Yeah, yeah. And things like that. And I, I guess the question is, like, what is the sticking point here? All right, John. So is, is there something about moving physical goods that make the business resistant to new technology? Good question, Tracy. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I think probably because of the people that are working within the industry, that they're in general probably let more change resistant, in general less technologically advanced, and in general probably more resistant to change uh, within the market. So I'm sure he's seen it in all of his others, businesses, waste management, waste hauling, rentals, transportation, and he's overcome it. But I, I do, I think there's probably a fundamental um, resistance in those in moving and hauling goods. Yeah. And obviously spent a significant portion of my career working for a builder on a job site being for many, many years, being quite poor at what I did and very reactive and very disorganized and leaning on the good salesmen and operations folks at people like Brand Vaughn, who would then have to react to me. Although I do believe it is more of a mindset. And I realize I know builders are quirky and disorganized and they're going to want things the way they want it, especially the big boys. That being said, I, I just I just think there's technology and there's little things that we can do to overall say, no, there's not inherently anything totally different about what we do. Yes, but I do think it's going to take a new way of thinking. And I see we're seeing some of that friction with some of the new talent that comes in our industry. But let me ask you just about, there are a lot of people that, well, present company included, excluding me, definitely including you, talking totally about you. If you look over the last five years, industry's done pretty good. And a lot of people have been pretty happy with, you know, net profits. The return levels that have been created over the last several years ha makes you also more resistant to change. Because if, just for generalities, if you were making 4% net profit before COVID and you were able to move it to eight, and it will take extra effort to move it to 12 and a ton of effort to move it to 16, 
a lot of people are just going to look back and be like, yeah, I'll just make double what I used to make and not spend all of the the money to get the technological changes, the headaches to get people to buy in and get onboarded, mm-hmm. the backside on dealing with customers. It's like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and make double what I ever used to make. What's the, you know, what's the, the return on effort rather than just making double what I've ever made? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. The the same way they've made better margins than they ever have. You look at BFS, their stock trading right now at 20 times earnings. I mean, so there's not a whole lot of things where you're like, oh, no, we've got to fundamentally change how we do the business to get the additional returns because it's never been that good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the number of people that are listening or people that work with other people who own these businesses the number of people who can say, our family, this organization, we've been in business for 60, 70, 80, 100 plus years. If you look at the last five years of returns, the last three years, it has never been better. Those are the conditions, <laughs> I think, from a logical point of view to say, do we really need to radically overhaul everything? Until- At the same time, but that's usually when disruptors come in is when people get complacent and they feel like, oh, I've got the tiger by the tail. Who could ever come in? Because it's a capital intensive business. There's big barriers to entry. No, nobody's going to come and try to do that. And then if somebody like Brad Jacobs comes in and invests a ton of money and looks long term, big picture. Man, that could be disruptive. It could be yeah. a good time. Well, this is going to be a move that if you ever want to impress somebody at a dinner party like you do, John, you just roll out a little quote from your favorite physicist, Richard Feynman, as oh, uh, Brad Jacob does here. But there's a great quote that, that I scribbled a note down. It said, Feynman's quote was, we are trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible because only in that way can we find progress. I often find myself a little bit frustrated most recently, with you know, over the last couple of years, as we have, we've got, well, what do we have? We have several hundred now, but it's just scratching the surface of sales reps in our industry that and their managers who are saying every month, we should be doing a forward-looking forecast on revenue in terms of a pipeline. And we're willing to make that commitment in 30 minutes or less per month. I just feel like there's an awful lot of people, regardless of age, who are doing the opposite of what they're saying there. They're just trying to defend the status quo because they don't want to change. And I mean, I get it. Change is hard, but I think there's a lot of people in our industry who are leading teams, leading organizations from a behavioral standpoint who are fighting Feynman's quote there about the whole reason to have a hypothesis is to try to prove yourself wrong. And that's how we learn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd agree with that. It's, there is just, it's an old school industry with old school methods and old school building practices and old school sales practices. Mm -hmm. And it's worked and people have been able to make incredible livings and incredible lives out of it, which is one of the most amazing parts about our industry. But at the same time, because of some of those things, it it is a barrier to change and that fail fast uh, and then rebuild is just not, not a typical process. All right. So let's run the second clip. Uh, this is another clip from Odd Lots where they're talking about digitization. There's a lot, a lot going on in there. I really have to enunciate there. And he was talking about, well, he'll mention it. He entered the business in 2011. And again, this is where I was talking to a couple of folks there. They're like, he came in in 2011 and he said, prior to our call, said, I've w- listened to the two podcasts that he sent, that I sent him from the end of last year. And he said, you could take away the details about we're going to be investing in freight or in lumber building materials. And he's like the, the quotes and the speaking lines and the, the overall, the trends. He's like what he was talking about in 2011 going into freight is essentially identical. To what he's talking about going into your business. So I thought that was interesting because it's one thing to say, Hey, we're going to do this here. I'm like, what were people thinking? Whatever that was 13 years ago when he came in and had no yeah. connections whatsoever And I think this quote kind of speaks to some of that and how he's going to approach it. But I'm not counting on that. I'm not Mm -hmm. building a business plan based on government largesse. That's nice. And it's an extra kicker, but that's not the guts of the business plan. You know, I mentioned in the beginning that one of the big eye-opening things is Tracy and I have learned more about these industries is 
how low tech communication is mm. and, you know, freight brokerages where it's still based on phone. I think we heard right, right. Maybe faxes still or maybe in the last few years, there's no more faxes. I'm not sure these websites and WhatsApp groups that, you know, super retro. What do, in building supply distribution, when you talk about how low tech it still is, you know, let's say Tracy works with some uh, local provider of lumber or whatever she needs. Like, what is the process by which the current status quo, these mm. these uh, these goods are delivered to a regional distribution center or to her house? So a couple things there. Let's start with the beginning part of your question about truck brokerage. Truck brokerage is not as old fuddy-duddy as you may think. Okay. It's evolved quite a bit in the last 10 years. Now, in 2011, when I got into the truck brokerage business, it was just as you described. It wasn't low tech, it was no tech. It was 100% people talking on phones to each other in a very slow book way. We didn't have faxes, it was still email, but it was not very machine to machine. Fast forward to today, RxO, which was the truck brokerage spinoff of XPO that Drew Wilkinson runs. Yeah. That business now, 97% of their orders are either sourced or covered electronically, digitally. So that's come a long, long way. Okay. Now, RxO's at the forefront of that. It's been the leader of technology because we invested in that right from the beginning. That was our vision. But even the whole industry, it's, it's not 97%, but it's, it's over half. Over half now is done electronically. So that's brokerage. That's okay. where brokerage has gone. Now, distribution is kind of where brokerage was 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Because there are, like I said, there are a handful of companies that are starting to do this digitally. John, what did you hear? Anything you agreed with or disagreed with? Yes. Oh, would you, would you like more detail on say that? Say yes. more about um, that. Say more, um, as the kids say. So digitization, e-commerce, all those sorts of things are big barriers to productivity in our space. It's a very manual process that we go about in our industry. And I think digitization is an answer to that, whether it's through, you know, peer-to-peer connections or being able to order it online. But the problem is a lot of that can't be solved by the LBM space. It's got to be through the building practices that national home builders especially go through, which is they got to get a field PO that gets created to a variable PO. Those get sent through. They got to make sure they get approved. They're sent in such a circle, then they have to like get us the approvals, get us the correct POs. It's not as simple as being like, oh, just enter it in online instead. There still is so many processes behind that that create additional work for both the builder and for uh, the dealer that creates some of that resistance to the digitization on that side. That I mean, that's and a lot of the things that that he talks about, whether it's inventory efficiency and optimization, route efficiency, optimization, all these sorts of things, which are going to be great for our industry that'll happen at some point. It has to not just come from that point in the supply chain. It's it's expectation setting, it's building practices, it's business practices that have to be congruent in the chain. And it's not just influencing this part of the supply chain. It's got to be all parts. Well, from, from a high enough perspective, if you're thinking about, say, XPO, less than truckload shipping, there's customers on one end who want things at a certain time, right? And then we have the stuff and we need to get it to them. From a high enough level, I'm sure there are, I know there are differences in customer preferences and what they expect and how it's done. But from a high enough level, that's what we're doing in our industry as well. And I asked you the question, maybe I'll just ask it again, what percentage of dealers that you know have route optimization software and what percentage use it to allow the magic of what Uber uses and ways that says sometimes traffic, some things pile up, sometimes a longer route is faster. And here's why. What is that in your mind in our industry? Ballpark percentages, numbers only, please. No anecdotes. How many have them? How many use them? No anecdotes. Fail. I just looking for a number. Okay. So I would say this may be a little bit too high, but I think like 90% of businesses in the industry have some sort of technology that's in their ERP system that it would allow them to route optimize. Those that actually use it, it's probably 10. All right. 
90 seems way too high. Now, if you say like it's buried in a nook and cranny of their ERP, ERP system and they have access to it, I'm like, suspect, dude. There's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of parts of ERP systems that never get used. So, Correct. but if you asked, had you asked the question, I mean, you're actually asked question there, big boy. So I, <laughs> 90s high, I, maybe 75. But okay. if I'm thinking about total share of ER, of LBM businesses in the country, now location by location, it's not 90%. But if I'm talking about number of routes shipped, I would say that it's north of 80% that have the capability of doing it. Okay. So we had this, uh, this was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we got called in and, and a project we had was, we had a very talented, very experienced gentleman who'd been in the business for 35 plus years, who did all the purchasing and had kind of forever. And they said, we have some young people, we can't just, part of it is shadowing, but the other part is like, what we want to do is, have you kind of think through with your team, break it down into videos where we could train anyone in the future with what this individual knows. And I said, well, sure. And they said, I think we should start off. You just, I want you to observe this person working and you were a purchaser for a builder. So, you know, <laughs> what I observed was, was a lot of really strong relationships from people that he'd known for a long time that did absolutely involve buying, but a lot of it was just working the phones talking about the local football team. It was very relational. And at the end, there would be some sort of quantity of treated two by 12s we needed. And I was asking, to, you know, to what degree, we always know we're going to need, right, some certain common products always in certain somewhat variable volumes, but in a relatively narrow band, we know we're going to have to fill it up. There's going to be bunks and bunks of this product. Like, can't some of that be automated? <laughs> And his response was telling was, number one, the market's moving pretty quickly. Commodities are changing. I want to know that information. I would prefer to talk to somebody. Totally get it. And so the other part is, I like these people. It makes my job fun. It makes the day go fast. I'm like, I wouldn't want to disagree with any of that. However, I also think you fast forward, and this is where, all right, could Brad Jacobs or anybody come in and say, 10 years from now, we went from essentially zero to 50, 60, 70, 80% of our orders. Some of those, there's an algorithm. I don't want to take this thing off the rails, but I am going to suggest that maybe AI is a big trend that is going to be part of this that can look over you know, decades of our buying and make suggestions for us. I do think there's still a lot of that just picking up the phone, talking to my guy and kind of and working the phones that way. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Um, I think you hit on something there. There's going to be the ability to keep a lot of the relationships that are important and some of the knowledge about the product, the supply chain, all those sorts of things that are important. But just that on the phone talking about who should, should they trade Justin Fields or not? Should they draft Caleb Williams or not? Like that stuff will stay to some extent, but it's going to be optimized out because of all of the terms that people and our industry hate machine learning, AI, predictive analytics, automation, optimization, all those things, they're going to continue to happen around us and to us if we don't do it to them. So um, I think those that believe that technology is not going to be a part of that, and, and especially on the machine learning side, they're going to retire and then never get replaced. Because the guy that he's talking to on the other side of the phone is all of a sudden not going to be there because they're not going to be doing that. So who are you going to talk to? It's going to be somebody else in the office. Then you're reducing productivity. You've got to build in productivity gains. And that's, I mean, I think that's such a big piece of what Brad Jacobs talks about within that is it's not getting rid of people. It's having uber talented people who mm -hmm. are uber focused and are really good at what they do. They still have good cultures, but they're going to drive productivity and efficiency through what they do. Yeah. And this gentleman that, that was there. And I don't want to come across as someone who's young, who's making fun of some, an old guy who's been around forever and isn't productive now, super knowledgeable. The question I always have is what if we just had 10% of that time, an hour or two a day that he could apply his wisdom and experience and expertise to another aspect of the business. And I think in all of our businesses, there's, there are more opportunities to improve than we can even, you know, write down. What if we were able to free him up to focus on that? And I think we're just going to see that kind of at an exponential scale, which I also think 
would also make it easier to attract more talent from other industries. Like how many people you know who kind of fell into this from another industry? We're like, I kind of love it here. These people are great. Yeah. I see lots of opportunity everywhere. But it's still like the idea that you would find someone from from trucking or work at Goldman Sachs or, you know, was working for Texas Instruments. Somehow they actually have to like fall on their back and end up in a lumber yard. And then we just don't let them leave. Like that's how we attract new talent from other industries. And I think if people realize that using these technological advances reduces slack in their system, they don't have to key in as many orders. They don't have to look at the confirmations and match them up and do all the scheduling and it's going to remove that piece of them. I don't think there's a lot of people that are sitting around waiting for stuff to do or doing stuff mm -hmm. to make sure they don't have to do things at work. But I think if you free them up from the mundane and can still have relational, can still be working on the business and still enjoy what they're doing, but you remove a lot of that stuff that every everybody hates to do, that's what machine learning AI does. Let me ask you a question. I got another one. Number, number only. It's a percentage. Number only. Okay. What percentage of companies that are listening have a functioning, active, capable fax machine as we sit here entering March of 2024? 90. Mm. It may be integrated into a printer, but they all got fax numbers. Guaranteed. See, that is the curveball where many people have said this, where we have a client who was greenfielding a new location. Everything's brand spanking new. And I walked by and I saw a fax machine and I almost lost my mind. And they said, you got to understand, it's integrated. We don't even use it. And then somebody raises his hand. He said, I used it. It works great. I'm like, I rest my case. Uh, let's go to this final one. This is, by the way, we're going to have to talk about this another time. Um, there's an incredible invest like the best episode that which this is featuring J Brad Jacobs featuring uh, Danny Meyer, the restaurateur that is just like one of the greatest leadership classes I've heard in hours. So entertaining. It's great. But so we'll talk about that later. Um, so if you if once you're on invest like the best and you want to listen to Brad Jacobs expand further than this little quote here, I would strongly recommend it. I think Patrick O'Shaughnessy, who runs that, does an amazing job. So here it is from Invest Like the Best. They're talking about integrating fast and forcing change. Because you have visibility into the business. And you can manage it better. You have a clear understanding of what's going on in real time. You have your finger right on the pulse of what's going on. And it's really important when you're leading a company, particularly when it's growing so fast. You have the controls in place. You have the oversight. You have the governance in place. When I was younger... I used to be concerned about the inevitable fallout when you do integration because people whine and scream, oh, I like this, I've been using this, and there's some temporary discomfort, but it's worth doing that. You've got to do it really fast. The other types of mistakes I made earlier in my career in acquisitions were sizing up the people. I think I've gotten better at that. You start seeing patterns in different types of personality types and different character traits and so forth, and that's the most important thing you can do is make sure you get fantastic talent. Max, could we talk about the positive and negative patterns that have emerged in the people? I assume you're talking about both the seller, whoever it is that is representing the seller or the seller themselves and their teams. What are the things that you've gravitated towards and away from as you've done more and more acquisitions? Integrating fast and forcing change fast is, I've gone through it on a small scale. I've gone through it on a large scale. It's hard and you're going to make a lot of people unhappy. But ultimately, I mean, when I did it at Brand Vaughn through a smaller scale, you know, six locations trying to push through an ERP change or a warehouse management change or a leadership change, being prepared, being super prepared on the front side and then pushing it through quickly worked really well. When you're at a larger scale, national scale, billions, man, that's hard. And especially when there's roles, goals and norms in place and people feel like they have ownership of these sorts of things. There's risk. There's certainly risk in not doing it as well. So it, it's just, if I, I would agree with them, you got to push it through hard and fast as long as you've done the kind of the foundational piece of understanding that it's the right solution. The problem a lot of times is with those big changes, they either don't pick the right solution or they don't have the right people doing it or they don't have the right plan in place. And that's when the next time you try to do it, everybody looks back to that first one and says, well, that one went so poorly. I guarantee this one's going to go poorly too. Yeah. 
it's the idea of, hey, if it's just a Band-Aid, let's just rip it off. Yeah. It's also like, are we just ripping off the Band-Aid or are we ripping off like an entire forearm? And we're, we're assuming the Band-Aid's kind of in there. It's like, you got to know, it, it has to be, there's, there's a level of precision mm-hmm. underlying that assumption that we can do it fast. Important to note though, and again, we don't want to stretch this into an hour like we normally do, but when there's a whole section where uh, I think it was with the maybe equipment rental, I think United Rentals, where I think they did like 500 over like two and a half years or something like that. Some crazy number crazy of number. M&A activity. And then like, well, at RxO, we dialed it back. We only did like 17 over three years or something that I think there's a skill that comes with that. And I think if you have people that are both empathetic, extremely knowledgeable and they're going to say, listen, this is going to hurt and it's going to happen for six months, but there's going to be all sorts of new stuff. But when we come out on the other side, here's what's going to happen and can help really drive that. But I've just seen that with, uh, with many of our clients where you're right, where the rollout wasn't great. The partnership wasn't great. There wasn't enough focus and attention of just really, we're going to disrupt the business on purpose because mm-hmm. at the other side, here's what we're going to get. And then you kind of get halfway through and we're like, all we're doing is disrupting. And this goes back to our earlier conversation about margins have never been better. We've never made more money. Things are looking really good. And now we're going to do this. And now our customers are pissed. Um, right. Is it all worth it? I think you hit on something there that's super important is, I mean, he talks about a lot in there having ultra talented teams, having empathetic leaders Get building buy-in, like things are just better when you have good, empathetic leaders that know how to lead people and get trust from their team. Because uh, when you have the trust and then you do the big change, then they're going to trust you more. But if you don't have trust to start and you try to push this big change and you're not an empathetic leader, that's when you start un- people undermining the process and trying to make it fail. All right. So we covered a lot of good stuff. So Appreciate the folks at Odd Lots and Invest Like the Best uh, bringing, bringing those Great episodes work. to bear. I will also say, if you just go to, well, I'm assuming you have an iPhone of sorts, you go to Apple Podcasts and you just search Brad Jacobs and then you scroll down through, it'll show you all the individual episodes. So, all right. So I would recommend to a friend, quite frankly, the book I thought was really good. John, zero to hundred. What would you give the overall book? 75. The Some of the stuff on art, meh, but uh, the rest of it, really good. Yeah. The, hey, this is this is right up my alley. Big, gr- big lettering, thick pages, gray blobs. It is a quick and easy read, but it's interesting. I agree. Super interesting. It's, it's easy to read, very, very large font. And every other page, there's a giant gray box that is just repeating what was said someplace else. You're like, you're flipping these pages, getting momentum really well. The... I'm interviewing for a couple different roles here. So the Appendix C, 45 core questions to ask. I Great. I flipped open. I've been using them. They're good. I think they're really good. So I'm going to type these up. I'm not quite done yet. I'm going to type these up. Obviously, give credit to uh, my man, Brad. and uh, But share these uh, with anyone who's interested. I think it's definitely worth 20 bucks. This guy is absolutely coming in our space. He wrote a book yep. saying, here is how he's going to do it. I would recommend you buy the book. Uh, It's good. Also, those two most recent episodes, I think, are the best ones. Odd Lots, which came out in December. Invest Like the Best was November. I would recommend you revisit those. So his claim, his commitment, what he's telling his investors. So what he did also, he went and bought the Silver Sun Technologies, which is a publicly traded company who was (laughs) trading at a dollar a share or something, and basically said, appreciate you guys already going public. You're not good at what you do. We're going to pay you some money to go away. We are then going to change this company name to QXO. And we're then going to put a couple billion dollars of cash in it. And we're going to go on a shopping spree. That is going to be happening, I, my guess is, soon-ish. This was all announced kind of at the very beginning of the year. So his claim was that by the end of their first year, so kind of a sliding scale and when we're going to start that, they expect to do at least a billion dollars in revenue and do $5 billion within years two to three. So let's, let's fast forward. Let's say three years, John. So that would be February 28th, 2025, 26th, 27th, right? We get back 2027, 
And we say, all right, how did Brad Jacobs do? Did he sell in the first three years $5 billion? What do you think the probability of success is based on what you know today? I'm not betting against him going out and buying enough business that, that he can hit $5 billion. So I'm going to give him 60-40 that he can do it because you still got to get people being willing to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be challenging speaking from personal experience. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think that he's got the chops to be able to do it. So I'm going to give him 60-40. We're going to be sitting here three years from now uh, during IBS when it's at Las Vegas and you and I are again sitting at home and say, man, can't believe he got to 5.2. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally biased at this point. Um, you drank the Kool-Aid. I drank you all drank the Kool-Aid. I went and started drinking the Kool-Aid on a podcast he put out in 2014. I like his style. Uh, again, way too much information, but I would say 75, 25. To your point, if you have enough money, you can just go buy businesses to get to 5 billion. And especially if you're kind of rolling in Europe, who, which of that, I know nothing, right? So I think you can. The question is, can he replicate his success? He said of those businesses, I forget which one, but I think RxO, GxO, XPO, he said for it like 55% Kager, compounded annual growth for like a decade or like since 2011. And you're that is just stunning. But even if he was only able to do half of that, pretty damn good business. And what he kept on saying was the three elements of his playbook are scale. You have enough cash, you can do that. Technology integration, and then essentially learning faster and adapting quicker. Those are like the three elements. And uh, it's going to be really interesting. So John, I appreciate you making time. You're my go-to here. I made you listen to a bunch of podcasts about this random guy and made, made you really enjoyed it. I've got some time, which is fun to be able to read and listen to podcasts and watch YouTube videos, but it was really intriguing. I'm be interested to see how it goes. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, then, friend, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Mr. John Vaughn. He always brings some clarity and levity to the situation and my thinking. Nonetheless, when there's someone like this who is going to come in our industry, no matter how you think it might impact you. If at all, the fact that he took the time to dump everything out of his head to say, this is how I've done it in the past and this is how I'm going to do it here. And we're like, eh, we're good. I don't need to do that. Now, do I think you need to listen to nine hours of podcasts and read the entire book? I don't. I will tell you just from a few of the items in the appendices, plural, in the back of the book, that alone, I've already used in interviewing and there's a few other things here that alone make it valuable. So even if this guy wasn't coming, I would say you're going to get more than $20 of value from it. But the fact that he is coming in our industry certainly makes it, in my mind, must reading material. So, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm sick of talking about Brad Jacobs. Moving on with my life. You, my friend, you're owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.